joy. If I cry, it'll be tears of joy as we look back over these 20 years. My wife and I are kids who are barely maturing in our 70s. and We hardly knew what we were doing until we started looking back. And still, we look over faces like yours and realize the blessings that we've had. So a most hearty welcome as we celebrate. Keep mitzion tetze Torah udvar Adonai Mirushalayim. Instructions will go forth from Zion. There's a Bible story for you already. I have a whole lecture on the disaster that when Torah was translated as law. It is law. It's rules and regulations. But it's instructions. It's guidance. It's teaching. How many of us other countries will dance with our law books? <laughs> but in this culture, people dance with the Torah. God loved us so much that he gave us instructions how to live. Choose life. Follow the instructor's handbook. And so we're in that mood of celebrating as we welcome distinguished guests from the Hebrew University, per participants, students and volunteers, relatives and dear, dear friends. As we want to give thanks the Kadosh Baruch Hu, recognize those who have helped us get this far and celebrate together with literally thousands of supporters. We're a little grassroots organization, thousands of supporters in Finland and in the States. Not only, but primarily. These color tags are people who are lecturers, so you might use that opportunity to approach us and ask your questions. This is a country of questions. One of our veteran students told the new students, if you like to talk, you've come to the right country because this is one great talk show. <laughs> but now imagine our delight when the vice provost Jonathan Kaplan said, I want you to meet our new provost. For us, these 20 years, the provost had been kind of a symbolic figure with an office way up high and barely met her once. The field was something totally different. And when he brought us into the office of provost, Malka Rapopo Hoval, she's a linguist a warm-hearted person with a love for linguists. And if you do a Google, she's written books and articles and lectured in universities in different parts of the world. It was a 45-minute introduction that resulted in an offer to give you a greeting. And so I would like to invite Provost Professor Malka Rapoport Hoval to extend her greetings as the director of the Rothberg International School for Overseas Students. Thank you very much. Do you hear me? Yes. Uh, so good morning. Uh, welcome to Israel. Welcome to Jerusalem. Welcome to the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, and welcome to the Rothberg International School of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. I must admit, this is an extremely heartwarming event. Uh, it's very exciting to see people from all over the world. And it's very exciting to see people from all over the world talking about the translation of the Hebrew Bible. Um, as you were all already told I'm a linguist by profession, and so I've taken an interest in your activities. And I'll just say two quick words. Um, you know, language as a cultural construct reflects uh, cultural reality, and therefore understanding a foreign language is in some sense a way of getting at and understanding another 
culture. Um, when you deal with translation, you deal with the hope that people of different cultures, through understanding languages, through understanding the respective languages, can begin to understand other people's cultures. Um, now, at the Rockford International School, that's one of our uh, fortes. We try to bridge cultural gaps, and being able to do this through under a deeper understanding of language um, is, I think, a very, very, very important uh, activity. And I wish you lots of success uh, in your deliberations today. I will only be able to stay for uh, one or two of the lectures, but I'm sure that I will learn a lot from what I hear, and you will as well throughout the day. So welcome, good luck, and congratulations on this very, very, very fine undertaking. With us also is the head of the special programs of the Rothberg School, Eric Saranovich, and I'd like to invite him to extend his greetings. Happy to be standing here with such an esteemable audience. Uh, I've only been working as a director of the Department of Summer Courses and Special Programs for about a year and a half now, um, which is much less than the long and well-established relationship between the, for the Bible Translators and the Rockford International School. Within the framework of the department, we have about 30 um, programs each year, and I can tell you that of all the special programs, uh, there are none nearly as special to me as the Home for the Bible Translators. I consistently hear from teachers at Rothberg how engaged and eager to learn the students are from the Bible Translators program. With their sense of duty to their mission, and um, the students in the Bible Translator program have only enriched the experiences of other Rothberg students, both setting examples for dedication and also for teaching others about world cultures. The efforts of every Bible Translators participant uh, here at Rockford, a result of the efforts of Miriam Yochanan and their devoted staff. To be honest, with all the problems that we have with every uh, program um, for the Bible translators, including the visas and the flights and whatnot, um, I'm never sure if each program is actually going to happen or not. <laughs> um, but because of their dedication to their work and to the mission, um, in their determination to bring the participants and students here, I've come to realize that miracles really can happen to those who deserve it. Uh, to each of you present today, on behalf of the Rockford administration, I'd like to say that it's an honor to be part of the 20 years of accomplishments, and we look forward to many, many more. The Vice Provost is out of the country, Jonathan Kaplan. But I have with me some words from the Vice Provost who accompanied us almost all of the 20 years, Shimon Lipsky. I'm sorry that circumstances prevent me from joining your very special celebration. I hope that my words will do as a substitute. HBT has been a true home since its inception, not only to its participants, but to all who have been associated with this remarkable institution. Allow me in the spirit of upcoming Passover holiday, which is the most family-oriented holiday, to address you as mishpacha, family. So to the extended mishpacha everywhere, blessings and love over Pesach and beyond. The journey of leaving Egypt toward the promised land and the journey of seeking freedom from slavery has not yet ended and might never end. We are all on a journey. We exit and we enter new places. We strive to bring the word of God of justice and liberty. We're on a journey to educate and expand horizons and we all pray for a better world. Yet as we pause from time to time in this constant burdened voyage, it's good to look back and assess our accomplishments so far and cherish the good memories that keep us strong to meet 
challenges. Celebrating 20 years of HBT dedicated and very successful venture is one of those moments of respite that give us all a deep feeling of pride and happiness for being partners to its achievements. I, for one, feel that the HBT Mishpacha is also my family. At whatever center table you sit, raise your second cup to toast these formative years when we were walking through the streets of Jerusalem, the halls of the Hebrew University, the classrooms of the Rothberg International School, and raise that third cup to toast where we have arrived today and what we are thankful for much. May God be with you, Shimon Lipsky. I would like to recognize the Vice Provost who sat in his office just before Shimon, Yisrael Roi. We knew as students already together. And so when we come to his office, these two Christian crazies with an idea of a Bible translation program, it's old home week of asking how's the wife and how are the children and so we've just had open arms from the beginning, incredible support from the Hebrew University. And not only from the academic and administrative staff, but also the lawyers. I want to recognize Anat Tal sitting here in the front row. The Ministry of Interior has tried more than once to cancel the program. Our students are just coming to be illegal settlers. And when we prove for the last 15 years what's the departure flight of every single one of them and appeal, they refuse without a reason. One time she used such big cannons that she went to the Attorney General of the State of Israel who came down on a high official in the Ministry of Interior who overturned the decision of the lower official. And that happened once. And hasn't had to go that high every time, but she has several times literally saved the program. And we are so deeply grateful to Anat Tal. Now, the one who was the head of the special programs most of the years that we were here was Joel Nesson. And he is that kind of a guy that he practically climbed out of the sickbed to come and share with us now. Divrei Torah. This is the first day that I'm actually speaking after about nine or 10 days because of some serious uh, bronchitis and laryngitis. We will see how the voice holds up. I can only tell you that for the men in the audience. If there's any discussion about family, not speaking for 10 days to your wife, for your wife is a message from heaven. <laughs> Especially now that we're cleaning before Pesach, she would say, do this, I couldn't argue. <laughs> I would my mouth, I would just go do. In the good days, I would say yes, dear, but even that didn't come up. <laughs> when I teach the Bible translators, I usually teach them through the pshat, through the text. See what the text says to us. Not what Rashi says about the text, not what Tosafot say, not what the Rishonim say, not what the Akronim say, and not what present day theologians say, because the idea for me is not to teach theology, it is to teach the text. And as I looked at the text of this past week, in the book of Vayikra, I said to myself, my goodness, what are we going to talk about? Sacrifice is a sacrifice is a sacrifice. And whether it's me a meal uh, offering 
with a little bit of a pancake, some oil, or whether it's meat, or whether it's birds. I mean, it's a sacrifice, folks. How much are we going to talk about sacrifice? How much is there in the text that really is not understood? Maybe, perhaps, the kinds of animals that we have to identify. It's a problem. And then I came across a word in the text that is not often repeated in the Torah. It says as follows. Not a word that appears a lot. And it's translated as being something that is maus, something that is sort of, as my grandson would say, fixa. Yeah. Something that's an abomination. And now you think to yourself, oh my goodness. Here we are starting a wonderful simcha. And I'm going to talk about something that is maus. Now I want to look to another text. But this is a text, this is a word that really does not appear that much in the Tanakh. So now I want to jump a good couple of hundred years, thousand years in history, and get to Sefer Yechezkel, where it is used again. And by the way, here it is used by Yikra, I mean Kohanim. This is what it's all about. Kohanim have to know how to do the sacrifices. They have to know what is going to be acceptable, what is not going to be acceptable. And this case tells us that if you leave this sacrifice for over three days, in other words, up to three days, you can eat from it. But after three days, it becomes pigu. Ezekiel adds another piece. And in Perek Dalit, a suk Yud Dalit, Yechezkel says as well, don't forget who Yechezkel is. Yechezkel is a Kohen. So if anybody should know about Torah Kohanim, it's Yechezkel. And what does he say in Pasuk Yud Dalit? Vayomer, aha, Adonai, Elohim, Hine nafshi lo metuma'a unevela utrefa lo achati min urai veadata veloba vefi basar pigur. So among the things that Yechezkel is saying to Hashem, when he talks about the chata'im that he didn't do, he mentions, I did not eat from basar pigul. But what's important is what Yechezkel says at the beginning of this pasuk. Nafshi. It's not just a physical nefesh. It is a soul. It is not just the nefesh physically which did not eat basar pigul, but it is the intention, it is the soul, it is that which comes so inward. So now maybe we're getting to the crux of the matter. Let's look at the soul. Remember, we're not talking to you. So, the end of the book of Shemot. For some 200, 250 psukim, what do we read about? We read about the Mishkan. And we read about how the Mishkan is built. And not just Okay, go get a couple of goat skins and put them up 
and this will be the house of worship. But we are down to the type of skin, to the type of knot that you have to tie in the wood that you have to get that comes out of special acacia trees and so forth and so on. In other words, we are down to such detail that one can almost not imagine a people wandering through the desert being able to follow these instructions. And yet, they do. They build a mishkan. Miriam and Yochanan. You have built a mishkan. You have built a home that is so detailed and its purpose is of the highest. Certainly not pigul, but certainly, yes, the nefesh, the soul. The two of you have put into this house your soul. And I say it almost the singular because the souls of the two of you are one in purpose. And it is this Mishkan that we are celebrating. And when you look into this Mishkan, you say to yourself, okay, so now we've built this wonderful home, what do we do with it? And we come into Torah the Kohanim. This is what you do. This is how you do it. This is how the sacrifices are to be done. Sacrifices in reverse quotation. This is the content that you put in. And these are the performances that you do because you do them out of the purity of your soul. You have put into this magnificent house everything that the Torah teaches us. You have built the house and you are doing Torah Takohani. Because what are the sacrifices? The sacrifices, the sacrifices are in the form of Tfilah. Tfilah de Bakasha. Anat can certainly talk about your bakasha <laughs> and her bakasha and the attorney general's bakasha. But more so your bakasha to Elohim about how you teach Bible translation. Why do you bring the people to Israel? Because it is important for them to see this land. It is important for them to understand what the nechalim are in the negative. First of all, we've got to look hard to find them. And that's the point of the text. It is important for them to understand the flora and the fauna. It is important for them to understand that here starts the Hebrew language. Nowhere else. Here it starts. And here it is important to use this language as much as one can possibly use it in the translation. This is the token. This is the Torah Tachoranim. And what is the tefillah? The tefillah is one of Hodaya. It is one of thanksgiving. And so we are the ones who have to give thanksgiving, not just to Hashem, but you are, through Him, doing the work that needs to be done. You have built the house. You have filled it with your soul. Ad me'ave Israel. And that's our vision, to keep it intense, to train mother tongue Bible translators to learn the language of the Bible in the land of the Bible. The program really got started in Abidjan in 1993 when there was going to be the dedication of a new translation and it was canceled because uh, the beneficent dictator died. And here were all these heads of Bible translation organizations for a celebration that didn't happen. And so Miriam and Julie Bentink, a Bible translator from England, sat those folks down and said, what would be the ideal program for Bible translators? And they brainstormed. And so we had something in the hand to present to Israel Roi when we came to the Hebrew University. 
and it got ramrodded through the academic and financial committees, and we were up and running in just a matter of months. Text in context. I picked up a new slogan just a couple of days ago. A text is a cart full of contexts. In fact, there are two contexts when it comes to translation. There's the context of the source text, and there's the context of the culture into which the text is being translated. And as things have happened, the pendulum over the last maybe 30 years has been swinging to emphasize the context of the receptor culture and language. And there's been, I would say, even a neglect of the context of the source language. So that it won't hurt at all to swing the pendulum back a bit and balance these two contexts because of course you need to know the culture. But if you bring a mother tongue national Bible translator here, they already know their own language and their own culture so that they can be steeped in the world of the Bible to the extent it can be re-experienced here in this land and where else more than here. That is our aim. In fact, we together with another scholar uh, in the States, doctor's degree from Harvard, John Munson, have come up with a new term. If we've got text criticism, source criticism, redaction criticism, historical criticism, literary criticisms, audience criticism, why not add another context criticism? Being very aware of the features of this land where the text was written. If you want a term in jargon, I'm saying this a bit tongue in cheek, the aim of a Bible translator, training of a Bible translator, is to reduce the artificiality of the cognitive environment of the translator. It actually makes sense that you want to take the wrong ideas they have about this country and about the language and replace them with correct ideas. So those of you who've been on the tour, we've asked of you every evening to write up something for your own sake and also for ours. What was new? What did you think you knew and you realized you were wrong? We had a Bible translator from Nagaland, northeast India, more Chinese than Indian. And he stood on Mount Zion, looked at the other way around, stood on Mount of Olives, looked at Mount Zion, and he said, oh no. I read Kidron Valley, lives in the Himalayas. He thought it meant from one mountain range to another, and he used a word that meant 50 kilometers instead of just one kilometer. So sometimes there are fun things that happen and sometimes more serious. As people, in their urgency to get the scriptures translated, have been translating from French and German and English to other languages. In an emergency, OK, you can understand that some people will do it that way. But anybody knows that that's not the best way to do it. And that this country has amazing resources that people who haven't been here don't even know. It's hills, it's valleys, it's roads. In other words, topography. It's brooks, it's rivers, it's lakes, it's seas, hydrology. It's earth, it's stones, it's ores, geology. It's climate, it's seasons, rainfall, meteorology. It's plants, it's animals. Farming, commerce, trade, military, defense. All these matters, even starting with such a simple thing as directions, yama, east. But in Hebrew, it's toward the yam. Toward the Mediterranean. Kedma. It's west. Kedma, looking toward the sun. Kadima, in front of you, the east. Negba, toward the Negev, the aridity border. As people got so used to that, that using our replacement words for what is actually said, toward the sea, toward the 
rising sun, you know, toward the aridity border. The King James has the people coming, Negba, out of Egypt, coming southward out of Egypt to the land of Canaan because they got fixated on it being a direction rather than realizing the context. And on and on. So why couldn't you study history and geography and climate and language elsewhere? You can. But when you study it here, you're standing where it happened. The geography, you're seeing the context of the hills and valleys and why the route went here and why the military campaign happened in that way. Climate, you experience it. Language, you speak it. And just for fun, some examples, grapes. One of the Nigerian groups thought grapes were grapefruit. And imagine Joshua and Caleb carrying a horrendous branch of grapefruit. <laughs> Hyssop was a tree. Instead of you know, the extremes, cedar and hyssop, positively, leadership, responsibility, negatively, arrogance. Hyssop, positively, humility, negatively, worthlessness. And just couldn't believe that the hyssop is this little furry herb. Or stiff-necked, translated as hard as a beetle in one of the languages. White as snow, they've never seen snow, translated it white as milk. What are you going to do in Oceania where there's a volcanic island with a little plain around it and the only animal that is herded is swine? You can't say the Lord is my swine herd. <laughs> You've got serious problems, you know, that have to be adjusted. Say the Hebrew word for sheep, they've never seen a sheep, and then footnote. We stood on the Mount of Olives again, looked at Mount Zion. The fellow from Papua New Guinea said, mountains? These aren't even hills. And the fellow from Chad said, no, these are mountains. And I said, OK, forget French and German and English and the way they've pictured this. You're now seeing it. So pick the right word so that the people in your language will get the right idea the first time around. Now, in terms of impact, we've had 129 students, 76 of them speaking different mother tongues whose languages and flags are displayed here, and our alumni displayed on the other wall. Some of them are not just better trained translators. We've got at least one on each of the Hebrew Bible Old Testament projects that are over 500 projects underway right now. And yet we'd like to have at least one of our students on every one of those projects. There are those who are Hebrew teachers. A number are PhDs and will be lecturing to you today. And those who have already gone on to the stage where they can be consultants. They can be the last one who OK the translation before it goes to being published. And then, of course, there's the personal impact. People of pagan background, people of Muslim background, the incredible love for Israel among people of Muslim background. We've experienced it ourselves among our students. They're not baggaged by Europe and those traditions. They're just reading the text. And it's exciting. We've had 48 consultants. They're overburdened. They're the bottleneck in the spread of the translations. They've got too many projects going on. And so they can't come, you know, maybe when they retire. And so instead, we gave them two-week programs, bribed them, you know, free guiding, free staying in our dormitory, uh, a van full at a time, eight of them. And it's worked. We've had 48 consultants who finally realized, yes, this is an opportunity. I should come. One of them, <clears throat> head of a Hebrew department at an international university was humble enough to say, in retrospect, I'm embarrassed that I dared to be the head of a Hebrew department and I had never been in the land of the Bible. So heart language, that's what we're concerned with. Empowerment, it adds significance to a people when they have the dignity of the Bible often being the first printed book in their language. And when a mother tongue Bible translator is able to say, this is my favorite, all-time favorite comment, 
it's amazing how much light the knowledge of Hebrew throws on the commentaries. That's when you're empowered, where you see the angle of the commentaries who are trying to explain the Hebrew text. So there will be more about that in the lectures, about the impact. So that much for our vision. Now I'd like to call on Brian Kwasnicka, our administrative director, who will tell us a bit about the tachlis, about the actual program of how we try to get it from your minds, the professors at the Hebrew University, and our minds into theirs. HVTs, 20 years, have been built upon two pillars, the text and the land. The Hebrew Bible in context criticism. And this has been realized in practice <coughs> through our semester programs and our short courses. But in order to undergird these two methodological pillars, of the Hebrew Bible in context criticism, HBT has fostered community. This is one of the first words that describes the practical side of HBT's programs, is engendering community, creating, fostering an academic and interpersonal supportive community. HBT has striven to provide an academic family here in Jerusalem, a home environment, which has sometimes been misunderstood as not being academically rigorous. But this is far from the case. Not only are Hebrew University standards high, but Miriam <laughs> has high standards that she keeps us to. Thanks be to God. <laughs> the staff has faithfully tried to keep the Hebrew text and translation issues at the highest levels that the students can benefit from. And there are five core courses in the semester program. Biblical Hebrew, 90 hours, six credits. Focus on grammar, vocabulary, prose, and the second half of the course on higher grammar issues and poetry. But also there are tutorials that are provided if deemed necessary, and this happens on a regular basis, so that no one is left behind. This is also to help them more quickly accelerate. And this is part of the home or community atmosphere. This biblical Hebrew focus is represented by Professor Emmanuel Tov's paper that will be given later today. Our second core course is text in context, historical geography and cultural context, which is four credits or 60 academic hours. This emphasizes the archeology, span the architecture, the flora, through Neokinamim experiences, multiple times, and lectures as well. Fauna, which is expanding even as this semester begins with a new biblical museum of natural history in Beit Shemesh that we've now utilized twice. As well as history, regions, periods, the famous lectures that Dr. Halber Bonin provides. And this second core course is represented by a number of two papers that we will hear today, Dr. Ronnie Sim, and Dr. Wayne Horvitz. The third important course was only added a couple years later from the beginning because Hebrew as a living language was realized to be a help in learning even ancient biblical Hebrew. This core course is represented by Dr. Aaron Horncall who will be presenting us a paper on these issues. The smallest of our five courses is called Discourse Analysis. And this is often subsumed into a biblical Hebrew course, but it is highlighted in the Home for Bible Translator courses because it provides an additional focus on, the, on a discipline that is a bit separate. It helps better understand the text as a whole. What is Discourse Analysis? Many people often wonder. It is an approach to interpreting the Hebrew Bible that seeks to understand a discourse's use of language and that examines the structure of the entire discourse unit to better understand the text as a whole, or another attempt to try to provide clarity 
to discourse analysis is a process of investigation by which one examines the form and function of all the parts and levels of a written discourse, a paragraph, section, or chapter, with the aim to better understand both the parts and the whole of that discourse. So we're not learning just vocabulary or semantic domains, but putting it together as a, as a whole. This is represented by Dr. Uche Aaron, who will be sharing with us later today. And finally, we have a June exegetical translation seminar that has been taught by some people who are here and represented by Dr. Kitty Barnwell and Bob Carter, who will be sharing later today as well. In this June exegetical seminar, the whole month is taken up in trying to put together all the pieces that have been learned and capitalizing on them for practical purposes in translation. These five courses couldn't be done without key faculty, a faculty, yes? And we want to remember the faculty that have been with us, some who are sitting even with us. Dr. Natalie Akun, Smadar Barak, Ricky Bilabong, Amnon Brook, Barak Dan, Aaron Horncall, Randall Booth, Danny Herman, Rafi Kasimov, Glenn Kerr, myself, Tani Notorious, Murray Salisbury, and Halvarani. As well as international consultants for the Exegesis Seminar in June, Katie Barnwell, Julie Benting, who we heard is instrumental in the beginning, Bob Carter, Noah Lee, Brian Vandriak, Hani Kuhn, Murray Salisbury, Tim Welt, and Linnell Zopo. And this is our core course, the five courses. But since 2006, and more systematically since 2010, we have realized a need to expand the work to touch the academic community who cannot be here for six months. And that is done in short-term programs, sometimes specialized specifically for that institution. Initially, a PhD, one-month course with Nairobi Evangelical Graduate School of Theology, next, later known as Africa International University. But also, specialized courses for international consultants that are only two weeks long, whereby these busy individuals who are responsible for so much can enjoy a two-week foretaste of what is to come. These two sections of our courses are represented in our schedule before us in three parts. The importance of the original context of the text with Professor Wayne Horvitz and Dr. Ronnie Sim coming up in just a few moments. The second part, our second pillar, a methodological pillar of Hebrew as a source language represented by Aaron Horncall, Emmanuel Tove, and Uche Aaron. And then our third part, the history, the legacy, and the future, the past, present, and future of the Home for Bible Translators. We want to thank you for coming, and uh, this is just a practical introduction to our courses and for the remaining time we have today. But it would be a mistake to continue with our program without acknowledging the founders. Dr. Halver and Miriam Rani, and in order to honor them most, we have asked Dr. Katie Barnwell, Bob Carter, and Sammy Toye to come forward and present a gift to Halver and Miriam. We know that Miriam represents the language, yes? And we know that Halvor represents the land. And we have been thinking of different aspects in how to highlight this. And Dr. Sami Toye has a gift to present to you that represents this in part. On behalf of all the members <coughs> of this from Africa, from various continents, we want to express our love and our gratitude for the time we spent here and what we have learned. We are so much grateful to that. Dr. Halbert's running favorite site in all of Israel is Lachish. 
<laughs> and we're going to hear about it in just a moment. <laughs> a brand new book that came out a few months ago on biblical literature. <laughs> This is the Hebrew University edition of the Aleppo Codex, which is a symbolic gift because we are hoping that even later today, or very soon, the Home for Bible Translators will now own also a pasul, <laughs> but still exemplary Torah scroll. And so we hope that will be coming later today. Thank you for this surprise. Thank you for this surprise. I'm not the person who likes this kind of occasion. <laughs> We have two more presentations. I, I just don't have words to thank you. Uh, I had the privilege of being here in 1993 when I saw this vision being born. I saw what was in your hearts and indeed, as I said, you gave your soul, you gave your being. Uh, to you had the vision of having a place where, not just a building, but a place where people could come from all over the world and feel at home and learn together. And we praise God that that has been fulfilled. And we thank you for your love and faithfulness, your vision, the way you have followed God's leading over the years. Thank you deeply from our hearts. home needs an Ima and an Abba. <laughs> and we're all their children. <laughs> we're so grateful for you and your love for us. Thank you. God bless you.